Okay, we are live. Happy Sunday. If you're in North America, it might be another day where you are, but we are live and I'm so excited. I'm always excited. You guys know this. I'm always excited for our guests and wonderful, juicy conversations about voice and life and just being human, really. Um, it's kind of a fun, fun, curious little thing we're doing here on this planet. So um, without further ado, I am going to read you a bit about my next guest here. And uh, this episode here, I put a little tag on YouTube. In four words, it's learning English through storytelling. And I think what more fabulous way to learn a language than um, making it interesting, right? Through stories. That's how we communicate. Storytelling is old as time, right? Um, and so when we make it exciting and uh, get to know the humanity through learning the language, I think that is just the ultimate, the ultimate. So um, my guest today is Brie AC, and uh, she is a podcaster, a co-founder of AC English School in Barcelona, um, combines her expertise in psychology and teaching with a passion for storytelling. She is super rad, I'm telling you. Um, through her podcast, Into the Story, listeners learn English through captivating true stories, while Brie guides guests on effectively communicating with non-native English speakers. Um, this is voice in the next level, right? Um, communication. And I really feel like this is an important episode um, for inclusion, accessibility, all that good stuff. Um, so back to her bio. This innovative approach empowers individuals to connect, learn, and embrace cross-cultural understanding. Heck yes. Come on in, Brie, and welcome. Welcome, hey, welcome. Hey, 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 hey. So tell me what it's like in uh, Barcelona right now. Well, in Barcelona, it is a very, very muggy Sunday afternoon evening. Oh. And every single time that I talk to people back home in Canada, I'm always so jealous because I feel <laughs> like you have all Sunday before you. But for me, it's, it's you know, we're winding Aww. down. Yeah. But I know. It's, it's the way Cases it is. Cases on Mondays. I know. Yeah. Time travel. But you have some wonderful things in your life that you're doing. And I, I do, I'm just in love with your podcast. I think it's fabulous. I really do. I think Thank you. Um, learning can sometimes be very stale and rigid. And I think you brought this fun, exciting approach to it. And I just, I, I'm so excited to learn more about how this all came about. So my standard first question, and it's the biggest one we'll talk about, is your journey to this podcast. Um, the psychology background, I'm fascinated by that. The communications, the journalism, all that good stuff. It okay. brought you to this moment so okay. where you created a pod. So tell me, like, as long or as short as you want, how that happened. So when I was born, oh, my mother yeah. has, I'm, I'm totally kidding. My, <laughs> my mother does love to tell the story that as soon as I was born, she looked at me and she was like, yeah. whoa, this is an old soul. But we won't go back that far. <gasps> yeah. Um, my mother. Yeah. See, that's why I love you. I, I, never, I knew that. that because the first yeah. time we met actually mm -hmm. was when you were on my show, uh, true. a story that has not gone live yet, but we'll definitely share it with your, your viewers, your listeners. Yeah. Um, so for me, storytelling, well, let, maybe let's go back to when, I mean, in general, and maybe a lot of people are this way. And I don't know, because sometimes things that you do, you think everybody does, but maybe it's yeah. not normal. Yeah. Um, but the way I see my life, the way I get perspective on my life is by imagining that I'm in a movie. <laughs> like when, like when I'm going through really, you know, hard times or family drama or something, I imagine I'm in like a romantic comedy and it just makes things light. You know, do you do that? Do people do that? I, I, well, we talked a little bit about this and I do, this will make one hell of a chapter in the book. This will make one hell of a chapter in the book. And that keeps me going. Yeah. 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 Okay. It reminds me of that movie Rebel Wilson is in about it, 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 her life turns into a romantic comedy. If you've never seen it, it might have. It might appeal. You feel, okay. I have. Yes. Yes. It's great. <laughs> so oh. I, I guess I've always loved stories, yeah. really loved stories. And then I studied psychology. So in the world of cognitive psychology. I worked doing ABA therapy for people with autism. So you're really training 
people how to do different things. One of those things for people with autism is communication and social skills. Mm -hmm. um, so then moving on through university where I worked in a few labs doing that. And then when I moved to Barcelona in 2010, I started teaching English. Um, and I really used a lot of what I learned in autism therapy to teach English because you're, you're training people. Basically, oh, we're going to go deep into that in just okay. a moment. That okay. is friggin' cool. Okay. I mean, I mean, so it was teaching, but it was very, it was a lot lighter than gotcha. uh, ABA therapy, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, and at the same time, I listened to a lot of podcasts. So 2010 to 2015, oh, yeah. maybe a little bit before it was mainstream, definitely here in Spain, I was listening to This American Life. I was listening to The Moth. Um, and really, it was a way for me to feel closer to home, really, mm -hmm. because that was a time when, you know, when I moved here, I was like, well... I'll learn Spanish. I always wanted to learn Spanish and I had yeah. no idea. Jill, it was very, <laughs> very painful. I have to tell you, like in a funny way, but also in a very real oh, way. Yeah. Um, it's very isolating. And, I, you know, coming from a monolingual place, mostly monolingual, I, you know, of course mm -hmm. we have French, mm -hmm. but I was totally monolingual. I had no idea. I didn't even have like a compartment in my brain mm -hmm. for what it meant to learn another language. Does that right. make sense? Yes. So yes. when I came here, I was in classes with French people and Italian people learning Spanish and they were like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, the verbs. Oh, right. Okay. Reflexive verbs. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Impair it. Okay. And oh, I was no. like, hey, wait, what? No, mm -hmm. no, no, we didn't. <laughs> we're supposed to learn that in English class in school, but I yeah. think I passed no. notes instead of yeah. paid attention. Yeah. yeah. So that was a very isolating experience. Just kind of feeling like you're on the outside. Uh, feeling like when you speak to people, people don't see you. They just see you through the filter of someone who's speaking very, very poor Spanish. Wow. They don't see your story. They don't see your humanity because you can't communicate it. And certain people are better at communicating through a, a language barrier than others. Um, but in any case, that time in my life was very isolating and I lived, I binged podcasts when I was cleaning my house and it just made me feel closer to home. Feeling yeah. those, those story, I mean, you know, this American life and, and the moth, they're, they're American, but it's very much, you're hearing about a lot of cultural things that feel close to home to you and just yeah. ways of speaking, ways of being that just aren't, aren't that here. Right. So then Starting a school, me and my partner, um, now husband, we started AC English School in 2012 together. Awesome. And we teach mostly adults, but at the time when we had a physical school and academy, we taught kids, teenagers, and adults. And then during the lockdown, yes. everything changed. Everything changed. So, a little bit before that, we started seeing a trend that everything was going online. We started doing, uh, we created a course, uh, an online course. And then in 2020, I had had this idea, you know, rolling around in my brain for a long time that I wanted to start a podcast and it was just the right time. Mm -hmm. So looked at a lot of different ideas. And then I remember reading a research paper, and this was the psychologist in me, that nice. they put people into, I think it was an MRI. And they were actually listening to the moth. They had these people listening to the moth podcast, which is true stories told live on a stage. And these are very compelling oh, stories. It, they're amazing. I've not heard of this. This is I'm writing it down. That's so it's like it's like an open mic night, but for storytellers. And people go up, and it's usually like seven minute stories, and they're just Jill. They're beautiful. They're really beautiful stories. Some are funny. Some are heartbreaking but the the way they're crafted they give me chills i mean i know i'm seven like a story minutes. nerd but it's seven minutes and <laughs> and it's just wonderful and so they put people in an mri and they look at their brains while they're listening mm. to these stories and it just lights up like a christmas tree so everything is firing so when we are listening to stories our brains are just connecting on all different levels. Oh, wow. They're connecting the concepts. They're connecting the emotions. They're also, when you hear someone telling a story, you connect with them more 
because what you're doing is you're mirroring what they're experiencing. Yep. So I was like, okay, well, this is it. I mean, if stories teach concepts very well, then language, absolutely, it just makes total sense. So that's how we started. Is that maybe I, that was a bit long, but no. you got the, do you know the, what? I, I always tell people before the show and I didn't tell you if, if I ask one question and you talk for an hour, I'm happy. If we, <laughs> if I ask a thousand questions and you talk for two seconds, I'm happy. This okay, is cool. wonderful. And I, I am just totally going to go into this. Um, if you could send me the link to that MRI study, if you still have it, I'd love to share that in the show notes, because I think we often don't acknowledge the importance of, I'll call it the arts, if you will, and how powerful things like that can be for development. So, so you said, you know, learning a language through that storytelling, the brain is just on fire because it's artistic and connection and vulnerability and authenticity with another human being, right? Mm -hmm. That's the big one. And I think that, um, yeah, I, I don't I don't think there's enough great things said about the I, I don't know if I'm overgeneralizing with the arts, but no, you know I mean? but but yeah. I think that all of us have had that experience when we're listening to a song, for example. I think that's something people are more aware of. You listen to a song yeah. and it just pulls on your heartstrings in a way that mm -hmm. you can't explain. And a lot of songs tell stories. Mm -hmm. And even if the lyrics don't tell a story, you maybe are putting a story into that song. Does that make sense? Absolutely. You know I mean? I, yes, you do. Yeah. And once yeah. you start thinking about um, the arts and life and communication through the scope of story, you see it everywhere. Mm. And you see how really, you know, since we were in caves, we've been using story to understand our world. And since we were children, we've been using story to understand our world. And I don't well, know if with yeah. your kids, you do this, but with my kids, I do that when they're tr going through something, I just tell them a little story, whether they're the main character or a different person, and then they can understand it better instead of just yeah. telling them the facts, you know? Well, and that's so, that's so, um, it, it's been done for so long too, right? You, you talked about the cave um, and storytelling in the cave person days, um, but also to the fables of the Victorian era and all those like little nursery rhymes that they made oh, yeah. to teach the kids things. And some of them are really creepy, but some of them they, are like, there's one here <laughs> where like a man takes the kids away. And I'm like, so what was the moral <laughs> here? Was it like just be terrified of strangers? I don't know. But yeah, like trying to protect oh. kids from yeah. Yeah. dangers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. Oh my goodness. So you mentioned something really fascinating to me and I actually pointed it out and interrupted you because that's what I do. Uh, the ABA therapy um, and, and teaching English and the connection there. Can you, can you walk us through in just a very general way about how that is interconnected? Yes. So maybe the easiest way to think about it is when I was in Victoria I worked in a lab with a professor named Jim Tanaka, and I don't know if he still works at UVic or not, but at that time, he had a lab called the Face Lab. And what he did is, well, his research actually started by looking at how people are experts in certain faces. And his research specifically looked at how we tend to be experts in people of our own ethnicity. That's just the, we are experts. Yeah. And then he generalized that to what about people with deficits in facial recognition? And he landed on people with autism. And so people with autism, they're, there's, a, there's a place in their brain that when they're looking at a face, a neurotypical person, their face would, their, their brain would be firing. Like, you know, you look at a face and in, in, in a second, in a millisecond, you know the yeah. gender, the age that you're given a lot of, inf a lot of information, whereas someone with autism doesn't have that. Oh. Um, but they would have that maybe if they were looking at something that they're very interested in. Certain people with autism mm -hmm. will have an interest in trains and mm -hmm. that part of their brain would be firing when they were looking at a train, for example. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what he did was say, well, what if we know that they have this area of their brain and it's working, but it's just not working the way it should be. It's not working to identify faces, recognition, mm -hmm. and also emotion. So what if we trained them? What if they played a computer game? He started with a computer game called Let's Face It that he developed in his lab. And what if through playing it, they could slowly, we could train them to become experts like a neurotypical person in recognizing faces. Neat. 
So we, I worked with uh, a few different colleagues and we also did a summer camp where we would, de we developed actual like tactile activities to mm -hmm. just train them to become experts in faces. So all of this training using different cues, using repetition, using positive reinforcement and just practice, practice, practice is the exact same as wow. teaching very low levels of English. So it's at about an intermediate level of a language. You kind of cross this barrier where you can start using the language. But before that, you're just learning the building blocks. And I'm speaking about mm -hmm. adults here because children learn completely different. Mm -hmm. But you do have to learn the verb and the noun and how they go together and to conjugate them. And yeah. you have to mm -hmm. memorize them and practice them over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. And if your teacher or the person who's facilitating your learning can make that fun, then then you've 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 won basically. Um, if it's really boring, like most of us experience yeah. in yeah. in school, like just stale. yeah, horribly stale, no yeah. no yeah. meaning, um, then it becomes extremely painful. Yeah. So that's kind of the the connection between working with people on autism and and starting to teach um, EFL oh. English as a foreign language. Yeah. That is super, super. Um, you hit on another really interesting aspect of learning language um, where we can feel when we when we're popped into a situation where we're it's not our dominant language, we can feel like we're on the outside. And uh, I'll use an example. My husband and I lived in China for six months and uh, personalities can be different in that circumstance. So for example, he, um, after day two, was like going out speaking Mandarin to anybody that would listen. For myself, I didn't talk. I was so embarrassed, even if I tried to learn a couple of the words, I was really nervous to launch that because, hey, guess what? I only know these words and how do I tell them I don't know anymore? Or, you know, I'm afraid that I'm not going to pronounce things right. So personalities can be different with like launching that language. And I wonder what your journey was like and what you've seen as well, is, uh, how to get around that um, trepidation around just putting it out there for folks. Yeah. Yeah. This is like a huge, huge, huge thing. It's a huge topic. Right. So going back to my own story of starting to learn a language and like sincerely, Jill, I was like, yeah, I'd like to learn Spanish, like sure. an afterthought, you know, like, why not? Like it's, it's something, you know, it sounds cool. I could like yeah. have another language. Totally. Um, so for me, I had never felt the feeling of not knowing what I'm saying and not knowing how it's landing. So mm -hmm. all of us, we, I mean, a lot of us are high social monitors. Like we know we're kind of monitoring our environment and seeing how people are reacting to what we're saying. I mean, maybe not all of us, but me anyway, I'm very sensitive to the words that I'm using, uh, how I'm, you know, if, how I'm coming off. So yeah. everything, you know, we've very, it's our whole lives since we're teenagers, like it's obsession on this, right? And then you move to another country and like all of the window. And you want to just be like, I'm funny and I, I'm actually pretty smart, but you just <laughs> don't understand. You will never know. You will never know. <laughs> so for me, I was like you uh, living in China. I was like, yeah. I don't want to say anything until I know yeah. if it's right. Uh, and yeah. that, in my opinion, um, as you know, myself and also teaching people and living in a place where I yeah. see a lot of people speaking different languages is something you have to break through. There's mm -hmm. no other way around it. There's no, you can't so, get good if you don't practice. <laughs> exactly. So people like your husband, they are like the Holy grail. They are the, it's amazing. they're like the say 5% being generous of people that I've met right? that are like, I don't care. I'm learning a language. I'm just going to try. I have to practice. Yep. Like he I'm, downloaded an app and's like, Okay, let's go. Yeah. Oh, wow. I need yeah. me some of that because I was like, wait, we need the textbooks. <laughs> we need the <laughs> verbalist. We need, we need, a teacher. We need <laughs> somebody needs to show me how to pronounce things correctly. I can totally right? see you doing that. I can see you. Oh, oh man. Oh, Exhausting that, being me sometimes. Anyway. But, but the thing yes. is, is that people who have that inside, and I think it's probably mm. something innate, maybe it's something learned, I don't know. Mm. Um, so people who have that inside when they start learning a language, mm. they just get an advantage because they're going to get more practice time. 
yeah. and they're going to get positive reinforcement. Like, hey, I went into a, I remember going into a, a restaurant and I had been here for like a year, a long time. And I asked for a fork, like a fork. Um, Tienes un tenedor. Do you have a fork? And she just like looks at me blankly. And another thing here is that service is different. In Canada, people are like so polite. People here are like, what do you want? Like literally, que quieres? What do you want? And um, and it's not rude. It's just. No, it's just direct. Greetings. It's just direct. Yeah. And so I said it a few times. And then finally, she's like, ah, quieres un tenedor? And I was like, that's what I was saying. And so I took that experience. So, so she finally got it. But after a long time, I took that experience like, oh, like I'm so bad. Whereas another person right. would be like, hey, okay, now I know how to say it. Next time. Next. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Being wow. able to just put yourself out there and use the language and not really care what other people think of you. In the end, a lot of it comes down to what do people think of me? You know, and it's the yes. same with voice, right? Yes, I think yes, yes, yes. a lot of people can be self-conscious about their seeing voice or speaking voice because they care what people think about them. Absolutely. Um, I don't know mm. if that's true or not, but that's just my feeling. Yes, it is. And and it's a huge block for starting a podcast, for example, or um, releasing an album. I know for me, um, the caring what people think or, you know, the judgment of, oh, it doesn't sound as cool as Mariah Carey kept me so stuck in the recording booth. So stuck. It even now sometimes creeps up and, and, and blocks me a little bit. And uh, getting around that, it's essential. It, it's absolutely, it's necessary. You have to, or you'll never... You'll never be done that project. You'll never, you know, launch the the language. Um, I, there's a famous story from my husband in China. He's just using language, right? And and at one point he looked to um, a lady that was helping us in the mall and he was trying to say something, I don't know what, something like, can you please help us with clothes or something? And what he actually translated to her, what it translated to was, look, I'm a horse. Um <laughs> And her face, we didn't know this until we got back and went, what, what went wrong here? <laughs> she just Something. went, <laughs> but he, you, you know what? He got up that like a couple hours later after we found out and kept going with that language. And so it was really a really cool learning experience for me. I got a little bit more outgoing with it after seeing someone else. So is the group learning effective when we put that 5% in with those other others like myself and you that are a little timid? It Does that kind of help the learning? I would like, that's a really interesting question. Um, I think what can happen is that because the people who just put themselves out there are just busy putting themselves out there. Sometimes they can, not all of the time, but sometimes they can start, let's imagine like a group setting, like you have, you know, six, eight students in a classroom and they have mm -hmm. just an hour or two hours a week. Sometimes mm -hmm. that person who really puts themselves out there, they start dominating because yeah. the other people aren't speaking, but that's the job of the teacher to bring yes. the other ones in. But yeah. honestly, the only way to get over this fear of using your language, your voice, whatever it is, is to do it. Like, mm. you know, like mm -hmm. I, I, I do yoga. I love handstands. You know, I've done a lot of workshops, but there's no way that I'm going to get a better handstand unless I'm doing a handstand. You know what I mean? Oh, like, that's such a good analogy. It, but it, you know what I mean? Like, yes, you have just, to do it. You have to do it and you have to feel those feelings that can feel mm -hmm. really scary and dark and like, yeah, you know, of I, they don't get it or uh, I, I look so stupid or whatever. Yeah. Um, so I've seen a lot of students as well who will be in group classes or even paying for private classes because they're too um, ashamed. They don't, they, that's, that's not how you say it in English. That's how you say it in Spanish. They're too shy, basically, too ashamed yeah. of their, their speaking, their, their um, English to speak in front yeah. of their peers. Yeah. They will pay for private classes years and years and years and they get comfortable with their teacher they develop like a rapport with their teacher almost like a psychologist and yeah. they will just speak in that setting where they are comfortable but then when Ooh. they go out into the world they they still they have the same thing and they can't get over it so yeah using it um, that's the only way this is where your psychology background is so fascinating to me because you would have some more insight into that process that maybe other 
uh, teachers of, of English in, in Spain, for example, wouldn't necessarily have that insight. So this is really, really cool. Our humanness in the language, it really yeah. makes a difference. Talk to me about your beautiful voice because you have a wonderful voice. <laughs> And I'm just wondering Jill, if that I was... see what you're doing here. <laughs> what? What am I doing? <laughs> what? No. What? What did I do? But tell me about it because it is beautiful. And a lot of people can't sit with that, but I mean it truly, genuinely. Thank um, you. Was voice a thing that you followed? Did you were you just born with a beautiful voice? Do you have a vocal routine that you do? What's what's going on? Um Thank you. That is very oh, generous of you. Hey. You're so, you're so sweet. Thank you. You really, you've given me a boost. I'm feeling you pump my tires here. Uh, I do not think that voice was anything for me at all. Um, mm -hmm. When I, I took an elective course in university where I did a theater class, no, a public speaking class and a theater class. And my public speaking teacher, he said, you have a very nice voice, like an anchor woman voice, like a low quality yeah. voice. And I was like, ah, okay. Like yeah. he, he explained it as the type of voice that can be quite commanding. I don't mm -hmm. know if that makes sense. That's a so good like, thing. Yep. That's, that's, yep. it can be a good thing. And then when I met my husband, he loves to sing and play the guitar and he's a very expressive person. He was like, you have a beautiful voice. We have to sing things together. So we would sing. Do you sing? Together. I sing alone in our house and we sang at our wedding we sang a song a spanish song that was very difficult but it's a very beautiful song i'll, I'll send you the link if not yeah you the, will not to me performing okay that <laughs> happened late night at my oh wedding. i was like yes please <laughs> <laughs> yes i will send you no sorry i won't send you that but i will send you a link to the, the song it's a very beautiful song um, um and then he has just been my cheerleader who's like you have an amazing voice like you should use it he's been the one who's always pushed me to, to, uh, to do things with my voice. As far as a voice routine, no. But when okay. you and I spoke, you were telling me a few tips about yep. the vocal fry. Yes. Um, that's the one I want to use this morning because it's early. <laughs> <laughs> Doing that and the, a few different things. Yeah. But um, yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's super. Um, I, I find life is like that. Like we get these little like hints at like, Hey, what about this direction? Hey, you have a beautiful voice. Hey, da, 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 da. Um, I find those fascinating. I had um, just using my own example. I had a. I, I was going through university to become something else because music was just not really. Unless you were a music teacher, it wasn't really like, yay, go be an artist. So um, I went and I did it through the back door. I did a bunch of English classes. I did some poetry classes to try to be, you know, an English teacher. And um, and then I did music theory to try to be a teacher teacher. Um, and what happened is I wrote a song for the music theory class and I wrote a bunch of poems and the feedback I got from the profs was pretty much get your ass back into the arts. <laughs> like, what are you doing? You, you know, don't stop writing poetry. You got something yeah. there and you're, you've got a really good knack for music, right? So when we try to, to go the opposite way of like, oh, I'm going to be more understood in the world by doing this. Life has a way of going, uh-uh, no, no. Remember that heart pull that you have? Like, go back yeah. this way. But, right? you have to, but you have to be listening. You have and to I be think listening. a lot of people don't listen. No. Uh, not listening to people necessarily, mm -hmm. listening to yourself, listening, paying attention to that feeling. Mm -hmm. With our podcast, the Into the Story podcast, we interview people and they tell yeah. us about different stories in their lives. And I recently got to interview the first Canadian to summit Mount Everest. And so cool. he says, so cool. So cool. He's such an amazing person. Oh, Laurie cool. And he, he talks about that, that feeling of, Hey, I'm actually really good at climbing. Like maybe I should work on that. And right. then at the same time in the eighties, they were, he heard about an expedition going to Everest. In the end, he ended up being the first one, you know, of the 20 Canadians. And I've talked wow. to a lot of other people and I hear the same thing said so many times that they're just like, there was a little feeling whether they felt very alive when they were doing this thing mm -hmm. or somebody said, Hey, you're good at that. And yeah, no. then they just started following that and it just kind of kept going and they kept pushing along, but you have to be willing to listen uh, yeah. to other people. And that, that feeling that you have inside that feeling of aliveness or flow or whatever you want to call it, the fire that yes. 
to borrow from your words, from your story. Ooh, 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 ooh. wow, wow, wow. I, I love how we're just like piggybacking <laughs> off each other. This is so good because that was the next segue. I'm like, that was the most interesting experience being on your show and and speaking um, in a way that I had to be conscious of listeners that weren't familiar as English as the dominant. And I wonder if you could share some tips for folks on how to, when you are the dominant English as your first language person, and you're speaking with someone who does not have that, what can we do to make that process more comfortable? Um, and, and really, I, I imagine it's exercising a lot of patience, but, but I'd love to hear what you have to say about how we can make this experience with each other more pleasurable. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, first of all, um, to be aware, there are a lot of different dynamics that can happen when two people are communicating in a language that is not, you know, if, we're, if I'm speaking in Spanish to someone or, you know, Mandarin or whatever. Mm -hmm. English is the language with the most linguistic capital. It is the most elite of the languages. Ooh. So when we're speaking with someone in English, there is a, and English is not their native language, there's normally a massive power imbalance. Okay, there's always some power imbalances in life, yeah. always. Yes. But to be yeah. aware that that's a thing, normally mm -hmm. you're holding the power there. So how do right. you deal with that? I mean, it's just something to, to be aware of. Right. Avoid being condescending. How do you do yeah. that? Of course, <laughs> most of us, because we, we're not familiar with it, right? A lot of yeah. monolingual English speakers, they don't speak to a lot of people who don't speak English. So they no. speak loud and slow and that's not necessarily a bad thing. But one thing that I think is important, and this is just a personal thing, is to never, if you just meet someone, never guess where someone's from. That's just maybe a pet peeve of mine. Mm. I really don't like, oh, because they're speaking to you in English. They're making a huge effort. And you're like trying to guess where they're from. You're just listening for their act like they could take it bad that their accent is not good or mm -hmm. that their telltale French or Spanish or Italian accent is coming through. It's a bit obnoxious in my opinion. Yeah. I hate it when people yeah. do it to me. Ah, where in where in America are you from? I'm like, I'm from Canada. Huh. <laughs> Rude. <laughs> it's just it's 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 yeah. I got it. So something on a more practical level, mm -hmm. it's, it's to the same tips as we're given to be clear communicators in general. Mm -hmm. It's speaking clearly, speaking specifically, giving your ideas in the most direct way possible. Mm -hmm. I remember taking a writing class and I think writing is a great way to clarify ideas. Mm -hmm. And I remember my writing teacher just like throwing out everything that I thought uh, a writer should, you know, show their intelligence and use big words. And she was like, what is this? Ch -ch -ch. Let's use the simplest word. Like stop with the passive voice, like the, you yes. know, the ball was kicked. No, she kicked yeah. the ball. Like, just tell yeah. me what happened. Yeah. yeah. So starting like use the active voice, you know, that's yeah. more of a gr yeah. grammatical thing, but just say it in a clear way as possible. Yeah. And then yeah. as well, I like to say things in a few different ways. So being very like watching the person, you know, sometimes yeah. you can yeah. see that someone's like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. But you know, they're not getting it. You they're just, not getting it. Instead of saying like, oh, do you not understand? Do you want, you just keep speaking, like say it in this way and then go around and say it in a different way. And then maybe say it in a different, I don't know. It's just being, it's yeah. the same as communicating with anyone, right? Yes. But you've got yeah. that barrier, that language barrier in the middle. That condescending piece is really huge because a lot of us can speak loud and slowly and it comes across as very rude, right? It, but maybe we, that's not the intention. I, I want to make that clear. Yeah. That might not be the intention. Okay. So then it's the intention behind what we say that comes across that that sort of emotions piece behind it that will no, make it I, land or not. What I, what I mean is that I understand, I'm sure someone watching this will say, oh, the last time I was in Mexico, I like yelled loudly at the guy who was, you know, right. was, or whatever right. it was. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I know it's not the intention of sometimes people who come from monolingual environments that 
they they think they're doing the right thing. So I don't want to like right, make it seem right. like I'm, you know, hitting down on those people at all. Got it. Got it. Got it. But um, yeah. I mean, the biggest complaint that I have when I meet, like, you know, when I'm coaching someone in English is that native speakers speak way too fast. That's okay. the biggest thing. Okay. So people... I, there's like a case study. I don't remember. It's like a car company. Maybe it's Volkswagen and they have to do some big deal. And there's like an American company and then there's another non-native speaker company. And they go with the non-native speaker company because they're speaking global English. Global English means the English that is spoken by, I believe it's like the, I don't know how many millions it's way more. There's way, way more non-native English speakers than there are native English speakers. Wow. Like I'm talking way more. So they're speaking in this case study. They end up doing business with the providers or whatever they are that speak the, the dialect, if you will, of English that's easiest for them to understand. Instead of the maybe the Americans or whatever they were from Texas or with an accent and who are speaking really fast and going on and connecting words and using phrasal verbs, which are things that are very difficult to understand, for, to understand, and they're using cultural references and they're like, oh, I don't understand. So, wow. yeah. Wow, wow, wow. Global English. That's really, really cool. So um, there is a movement, um, I'm sure it's all over the world, but especially uh, in, in the BC government and uh, I think Canada's whole government to use plain language, what we call plain language, mm -hmm. so that it's easily translatable if someone or easier to read, like take out the fancy verbs, um, short sentences, bullet points, all that kind of good stuff. Um, to make it accessible. That's a big, big, big movement. In fact, yeah. I know there's a lot of websites being, you know, redone so that you're reading it. And what, what they say here is that your, your mom can understand what's happening. You're, you know, it, it's not that it's, um, there's a hierarchy of understanding here where you have to know a bit of government to understand this writing. Right. So I'm, I'm starting to see that maybe like the, the advertising example you gave, like other people are starting to understand that global English is, a, is definitely high on the list of what to gear things towards. That's really very cool. Absolutely. And it's not easy. So, you know, with, with our podcast, I want to create a experience similar to, you know, the moth or this American life where my listeners are experiencing this story and these ideas and they're feeling emotions, but I have to do it in a way that the language is very plain. It's global it's global English. And even me that I have a lot of experience, it's difficult to make yeah. your ideas that clear to, I have a blind spot majorly. I have to run everything that I do through my husband because he sees it. He's from here. He, he sees like, no, 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 no one's going to understand that. Like, and I just do that's totally because uh, you know we don't know what other people don't know. So it, it's not something that's easy, but I think definitely starting is short sentences, speaking directly and if there's an easier verb, if there's an easier way to say it, always choose that. And I think that's mm -hmm. the best way to be in general. Like I like to speak that way to when I go back home as well, when I communicate with, you know, Canadians, with native speakers, mm -hmm. just to speak in a way that's very clear. I don't mm -hmm. know. I like that. So, so our tips here are, you know, if, if you can, don't be afraid to use that language. If, you, if you're not speaking English as your first language, come out. And people will have understanding and patience and then, and then hopefully we can, we can have a conversation, but use that language. Um, and on, from the other side, uh, if English is your dominant language and you're speaking with someone who that's not the case for them, uh, slower, simpler sentences, active verb, you know, active voice, um, mm -hmm. simple verbs, all that kind of good stuff. Um, and does it take practice for that? Because do we feel at times that we're censoring ourselves and that that other person isn't seeing our full selves either because we can't use our full language? Do you run into that at all? Yes. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. I think that that's definitely true. That being able to show your whole self. Yeah. I mean, I, I suppose in my case, I use English a lot. I have international friends and will speak in English sometimes. I speak in English sometimes mm -hmm. with my husband and showing my whole self through this different 
I'll, I'll call it a dialect. I don't mm -hmm. know if it is, but a, the dialect of global English mm -hmm. um, takes practice. It mm -hmm. takes practice. It takes concentration. I notice when I go back home, I communicate in a different way. If I'm just with my friends, you know, like let loose. Yeah, 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 yeah. It feels very comfortable. I don't have to have that awareness. Like for me, it's it's quite automatic, but it does definitely take practice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Take yeah. practice. But I mean, come on, it's it's okay. We're all humans. If you approach it with yeah. empathy, like anything, you approach it with yes. empathy, understanding yeah. that person is making a massive effort. And for them to get to where they are, to have a com if you're having a conversation with you, has taken a lot. Yeah. It's always nice. And only if it's genuine, right? Don't do yes. it if it's like contrived, but to give the compliment, like, wow, what um, you speak amazing English. Everyone loves hearing that. That's so wonderful. The other piece that I want to point out is that it's so rewarding to, as an English dominant speaker, to go through this process with someone who isn't because you know, we can tend to go, Oh, I just, you know, I'm so busy. I'm super busy. I don't have time to stop and explain what I'm saying. But in the culture of hustle bustle, we, we need these moments of slowing down and, um, you'll, you'll make someone's day. And, and honestly, you'll feel just the empathy piece, the connection piece, it's rewarding. So it's rewarding. And it, and if then <laughs> you ever get the opportunity right. to, to learn another language, which is an incredibly rewarding mm -hmm. um, process. They mm -hmm. say they, there's a quote, I forget from who, but to speak another language is to possess another soul or something like that. Wow. And it is, it is very true that, that you open up compartments in yourself yeah, that you you have a different like I have a different personality when I speak in Spanish. Wow. I like I was saying before about the service here, for example, that things are just very direct. Like you mm -hmm. walk into a, a bar, like a, a cafe, it's called a bar, and I would never walk into a cafe and say like, "Hey, give me a coffee." <laughs> you know what I mean? Like I could never <laughs> do that. Never, because first of all, I'm Canadian, and yeah, yeah, yeah. politeness mm -hmm. is so high up on the scale for us. It's just very important in our social structure, right? Yeah, yeah. So I'd walk in like, hey, like when you have a chance, could you possibly, if you <laughs> possibly, and it's like, oh I'm my God. I'm sorry for asking. I'm sorry. <laughs> you know what I mean? Oh, Canada. So, like the freedom, oh Canada, yeah. the freedom to like walk in somewhere, and just like lean up on that bar and say, give me a Give coffee. me a coffee. Jinx. That was amazing. Um, <laughs> it's it's really cool and it lets you, you know, assertive. Learn a, yeah, assertive or, or learning about the small talk. For example, oh. this I know this is very silly, but here, okay. Yeah. When you cross someone on the street, yeah. you say, if you know them, you say bye. Don't ask me why. Oh. Yep. Yep. Adios. Okay. So I cross my neighbor who I see. I know him. I say bye. I'm essentially saying to him, uh, you, I am acknowledging that I see you, but I don't have time to talk. But if I see someone that I don't know, I would say good morning or good afternoon. It's like all these things. It's wow. just, it's so cool. Yeah. There's all sorts of just different things, but anyways, yes. Oh. Having empathy, slowing it down for people. And then if you ever get the opportunity to learn another language or you are learning another language, you will appreciate it for sure. If someone yeah. gives that, gives you that empathy. Wow. Oh. There's so much more to talk about here. Like when you're traveling, what are some tips on learning the language, right? Because you don't need to know everything. You, you, you don't. Is there apps? Is there, what would you recommend for someone? I mean, I know that's so general, but yes. where, where can they start? Would, would it be, you know, apps are really great. Go get an app and help, you know, or take your phone with you or get a travel guide. Like what would you suggest? <clears throat> well, well, I mean, if you're just traveling somewhere and you just want to use the language, yeah. I would not use an app personally. Okay. I would do like as I go. Okay. Oh, oh. I am, I don't know if this is going to be political or something, but <laughs> I use chat place. GPT for a lot of things. Okay. Oh. A lot of things. Um, so I will write an email um, in Spanish. I will write an email and then put it into chat GPT and say, make this, um, Social, like this is embarrassing. Make this socially appropriate for someone, a teacher that I know at my kid's school, and it gives me like the proper register. The register oh, being wow. like the the formality of the language, because that's something that's very difficult once you reach a certain level of language. Like, what's appropriate to say to like 
the mom from school in a WhatsApp who I want to this morning. Oh. Like I asked my husband this. Um, I have to ask. I'm going to a birthday party. How do I ask her to give me the direction, the um, the address? Oh. Do I say like do I say podrías pasarme, which seems very formal, or do I do it more direct? Mm -hmm. So what I would recommend for someone learning a language, just I mean wanting to go to a country, is use something like the translators now are amazing. And the yeah. first things that you want to know are the greetings. Good, you know, in a lot of places in Europe, for yeah. example, it's extremely mm -hmm. important that whatever you go and to whoever you see before anything, you say good morning, good afternoon, or good evening. If you don't do that, you're like the rudest person on the planet. If you just walk into a store and say, oh. hi, do you have this in my size? They're going to be like, oh, oh. Americana, you know? <laughs> so oh. walking oh, so in, interesting. good morning, and, you know, ordering a coffee or a water, those basic things, and then go, going, you know, a little bit more, a little bit more and using Google Translate or ChatGPT or, or, or whatever you want. But that's getting so cool. a phrase book that's like 100 pages or 300 pages of all the verbs, like that's just, it's not. It's too much. No, it's too much. Yeah. And then you're just going to get bogged down. Just start with the greetings. That's what I would say. And then ordering wow. things and then kind of adding things on slowly. That and just what I'm taking from this is just learning a little bit about the culture before you go there so that it doesn't come across as rude. But I, I imagine, though, if they hear you speak and, you, and, you're, and you're slower and they will they will possibly understand that this isn't your first language. And they will, under they will understand before yeah. you open your mouth. <laughs> okay. I mean, it depends. Yeah. On Okay. Like here in a very, for example, Barcelona, it's a very touristy place. People here have grown up with tourism. Yes. They can see from literally 100 meters away the way you're walking, the what you're wearing, the way you're moving, that you are a giri, which is like tourist kind of. Yeah. Um, so they will know. And a lot of people will try to automatically speak to you in English for sure. Oh, wow. So that's a place like here. But that's then you cool. go to a place like France and it's different. Mm. Um, people, yeah. mostly you are absolutely expected to try to speak in French. I've heard depending this. on where you are. Yes. And yes. they're quite particular. I'm not going to knock on the French right now. I have a lot of French friends who I love, but they're very particular. Yeah. Um, but I think anywhere you go trying to, yeah, getting to know a little bit about well, the culture, the culture. Yeah. and most people will try to practice their English with you. Definitely. That's so cool. Our humans are cool, right? There is yeah. this like need for connection and especially if we see someone um like i felt in china a little lost puppy i was like oh god people would see me and go hey it's okay you're doing yeah. good like and that's you know we just recognize that yeah. and that's the thing that so many people learn english so they understand like there aren't very many people like in Canada or in England or basically all the English speaking countries that you can find so many people who only speak English. Mm. Most other people have the concept and, and will empathize with you. Wow. But what I find really interesting about your work, Jill, is that mm -hmm. I've spent so much time thinking about the words and the concepts and very little on the voice mm -hmm. as a way to show ourselves, right? Mm -hmm. And I think it's just amazing how listening to your story that you told that we're going to recommend oh, wow. that um, that a lot of us are afraid to use our voice, but it's not because we're afraid of the actual voice itself. It's we're afraid to show what's inside yeah. Yeah. We're to show the ideas. Yeah. Yeah. And um, speaking out, you know, like just um, using enough breath to get that sound to come out mm -hmm. is often the breath is the first to go, which is why, um, and I'm not saying that vocal fry is only that it's a kind of a trend in, in, um, some voices to talk like this. Um, and I mean, no disrespect with that, but it is in fact, us not using breath. And what happens when we're nervous is the breath is the first to go, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, if you're public speaking, you're like, Oh God, I can't like breathe. Gulping in awful. air. Right. <laughs> so, but what puts people on, um, what, what takes them off edge and, and makes them comfortable is that melodic sort of breathy sound going through it. Almost like we're mm -hmm. singing. Everything's elongated. The breath is moving and flowing and it takes us out of fight or flight. Cause when we see someone like this, we kind of go, what's, what's, what's going, going on? on? Yeah. Right. And you're mirroring their emotion. You're like, what's, what's it. going on here? You're nervous. The co-regulation. Mm -hmm. You got it. hundred percent. So, um, it, it's, a. Uh, 
it's just something to be aware of. It's not something to deter you from using that voice because you don't have your tone, right? No, please don't do that. Um, but it's just something that next level of speaking, you know? Um, I have a question for you about accent. Mm. When we learn another language, is it, I don't know how to ask this. Is it rude to try to comp the accent when we don't really know how? Mm. Is that something that comes later? Does it, does it come across as mimicking or is it, is it actually accepted? Well, that is a very interesting question. Honestly, it's a very interesting question. And yeah. it's a matter of taste, maybe. Most people, maybe, I mean, maybe it honestly has something to do with people who can just, who have good tone. I don't know what it's called. You know, when you're, some people are tone yeah. deaf, they can't. Yeah, yeah. Um, so if you are tone deaf, so to speak, mm -hmm. you probably are going to have a really difficult time getting to a place where you can try to mimic an accent. Like you can't, you're not even on that level. You can't hear it. Mm -hmm. But perhaps if you are a very musical person, you can dominate the words, the concepts, and then mm -hmm. move on to trying to, to perfect that accent. Mm -hmm. I will say that with my students, people can obsess about accent mm -hmm. and it's not important. It's it's kind of vain, to be honest with you. It's a bit of vanity, I think. Yeah. I so this is something people tell me that I have a very good accent. Okay. I didn't yeah. try. I never tried to mimic it. Just I just well, I do. I mean, I, you try to say what other people are saying, right? You s try to say it in the same way. So maybe yeah. I just have this thing where I hear it and I can mimic it. Yeah. But it's not something I'm doing like on purpose. And then I hear other people who speak fabulous Catalan and or Spanish, mm -hmm. Catalan being the local language here, but they speak it with a very, very, very thick accent of their mm. their, their mother tongue. But that's mm. fine. That's completely right. fine. Right. Um, and I have heard people speak in English who are Spanish mm -hmm. speakers mm -hmm. that speak with a very good accent, but then there are other people, and I can't describe it, Jill, but they're trying really hard to put on the accent. So yeah. specifically with, I can hear it, especially when they're putting on an American accent and what that sounds like is just putting on very, very hard and, and abrasive R's. Mm. And it's like a sixth sense maybe I have or everybody has it, but you can feel when it's not natural. And maybe it comes yes. back to the breath, right? Yeah. Like our yeah. voice gives us away automatically yeah. if we're not being authentic or we're nervous. So if someone's yeah. like, speaking, but then they're trying to imitate really hard uh, an accent, then it's probably going to be felt and it feels not good. Yes. I don't know. Yeah. No, this is totally right. Uh, for me, if it lands, not right, but for me, it lands and it, and it relates to singing. So I always tell people when we have an outward focus in, in, in meaning, what will people think? How will people take me? It comes across as over singing or inauthentic. Mm. But when we have an internal focus, what's the story? What am I trying to say? What What's the meaning? It it comes out in recording or singing live very differently. And, and it's not as loud and it's not as pushed and it's not as forced. It's still resonant, but it's not as, yeah, forced. And, yeah. and, um, and it comes across very, very authentic when that's that internal focus of the delivery. It seems very like selfish and self-involved to be like, I'm just focused on me and having a good time, but it's not, it really isn't. It's like, just be in it and people will understand and want to be invited into your world. That's what they want to do in singing. So that's, it reminds me of that. That's yeah. so interesting. And I think that's absolutely true. Yeah. I think yeah. that's true for anything. I, yeah. I mean, <laughs> like for you, your area of, of expertise is being voice and my, well, I, don't, I won't say expertise, but storytelling sure, and language. I'm an expert. Expert. Um, Damn it. Yes. Every, it, it's so much, you can generalize it to everything. If you're just like yeah. doing you yeah. and you're yeah. like it, focusing on, not just focusing on you, but like you said, and the experience and being curious and really trying yeah. to get to the, the, the real stuff, then people, will, mm -hmm. the right people will want to be invited into that space. But yeah. when you are outward focused um, and you're focusing on how it's seeming, it feels forced. And I think that's yeah. what I'd like to say about certain people who try to put on the accent. It feels forced. Yeah. And then that's all you can focus on. 
is like yes. the forcedness of the the accent. And perhaps I've listened to people when they were singing before and I didn't like it mm -hmm. because of that. I'm not as attuned to, to singing, but um, yeah, true. it just feels different. And maybe it all comes to here, holding things yeah. tighter or or something. I don't know. Yeah, it's the it's that it's that energy behind it. It really mm -hmm. affects the, the delivery of the, of the singing, right? Or of the speaking. It's that energy behind it. We can be nervous, but if we're still inward focused, it comes across way more authentic, mm -hmm. right? Even without some of the breathing, <laughs> it's more authentic and it lands better for that other person. So it's, again, we, we don't have to try so hard. That's the biggest thing in singing is ease. I always say, you know, um, it's tempting to go in and try hard and bless your hearts. We all need to go through that process to get that thing, to get that technique. But once we got that technique, whew, it's yeah. okay. Let's chill. Let's just mm -hmm. lean back and, and know that we've got it and just be it instead yeah. of doing it. Just be it. And it's the hardest thing to learn. It's the it's hardest a, thing in singing. <laughs> but it's like, it's like headstands and handstands. You got to yep. do it. You can't, you can't watch it. I mean, it's good to watch other people because then you can mirror them, but you yep. have to, yep. you have to learn those muscles. You know, yep. my wrists yep. are not going to get stronger watching YouTube videos. <laughs> oh, hundred percent. And I love that you brought up yoga because in yoga, there's a saying, stay on your own mat. Hmm. And that one is huge. Like, yeah. yes, Just look around for inspiration and then come yeah. back to your own mat because yeah. don't worry what these people are doing and that their handstands are better or worse or whatever. Yeah. On your own mat. Totally. You are fabulous. I wish we had more time. Um, I want to talk to you about where people can find you real quick and okay. um, how to connect with you. And you are looking for people to share their stories. So I want you to talk a little bit about that as well. Okay. Go for it. Awesome. Well, if you have anybody in your life who is learning English at a, an intermediate and above level, you can direct them to Into the Story on any podcast platform. Yes. So learn English with true stories into the story, you'll find it. Or if you just want to listen, I mean, my mom and I'm sure my aunties and cousins listen. So if you want yes, to come on I in and have a listen. Great. Um, yeah. And we are absolutely, we're always looking for people to tell stories and everybody has a story. So if, if, if you have anybody out there, you're interested in telling a story or practicing using your voice, it's a very, very good opportunity, you can send me an email directly. So it's brie at acinglace.com. I think that Jill will share that. And yeah, if you're interested in, in knowing anything else about us and the classes and, and coaching that we do, again, teaching EFL, teaching English as a foreign language, you can go to acinglace.com. Oh. And that's, and that's everything. Okay. This, was, it. this was super so, pro. I'm super pro. Hey, I'm an super expert, pro. Del. It, it and, was fun. P.S. Like, and you I helped wasn't me feel kidding. like you're the first person who said that I have a, a good voice other than my husband. Bless him. Yeah. But thank you. That's oh. really, really kind of you. I'm sure more people think it. They just don't say it because it, it's kind of not something we say to people. Right. But I'm sure I, my mom thought it when she was looking in my eyes, this old soul, she's going to have a strong voice. This girl. She's probably going to watch this. She'll probably well, watch this. Well, and uh, maybe next time we can have you on about your singing because that would be, oh my gosh. that would be, maybe we could sing something. I don't know. Who knows? It's yeah, crazy. Right, thank you so right. much for everything. And thank I, you. I, I want to end on a note of um, your, I always say to people, brilliant light in this world, but you are. And this is a really important um, line of, work and passion that you're doing and and to put that effort into a podcast like it's a lot of work and uh two thumbs up because it's needed and valued so um thank you for being here um i'm going to do something a little different and just end the show with you because i know you got to go and i want to say bye to you <laughs> okay. so um uh thank you everybody for watching us um you can find out more about us Voxana.co. Look at me be my producer here. I'm friggin' sailing through. And Facebook. I'm not on Instagram yet. I keep saying that. I will. Voxana.co on um, Facebook as well. So, um, yes, thank you again for everything, and we'll see you next time. Awesome. Thanks, Jill. It was really thank fun. Thank you. I don't want to end the stream. I want to see now I've just messed up my production. My goodness. Yes, I do. Okay.